I was planning on finishing up episode 1 of the Amir Timur campaign today, but Tailworld said nope, and presented us with this massive 1.8.0 patch. There are so many things to cover, the video would be over an hour in length to hit everything, so I'm picking out what I think are the biggest changes. Starting with the crash fixes. It's a pretty long list, which should be helpful to some. A few of these I experienced, such as the hideout crashes and executing the last living member of a clan crash. I was able to get a couple hours of game time in on the new patch during my first livestream today, and it ran very smooth. Menus were quick, maps loaded instantly, and more importantly, large battles were mostly smooth. There was a tiny bit of stutter during a siege scene that had max units in the field, plus some smoke and fire, but it was staying above 50 FPS, which is great to see. Under the art section, there are a couple things to cover. Six Towns got an update and they look great. Danustica had a nice facelift, as you can see here, with a beautiful central marketplace. There's a lot to explore after going over the river and into the back half of the town. There are over 20 new armor pieces, but we will focus only on the Vlandian armor since there's been no new Vlandian armor since... Actually, I think this is the first patch. We will go in order of cost, starting with the pauldrons with cape. It costs 2,500 dinars and offers 8 armor for the body and arms. The ornate pauldrons give the same armor stats for another 300 dinars, but look a bit more imposing. The scale shoulder guards come in at 4,400, but offer double the armor for the body, which seems like a fair deal. The ornate pauldrons with cape is where things get pricey. At 17,500, it offers only 15 armor for the body and 12 for the arms. I guess if you have the money to burn, it's okay. Upgrading to the reinforced ornate pauldrons will cost you 42,000 dinars and grant a little more body armor, 20 for the body and 12 to the arms. And finally, the creme de la creme, the reinforced ornate pauldrons over scale come in at 61,000 and offer only two more body armor, 22 in total for the body and 12 for the arms. Most of these look decent enough and it's nice to have more variety for the Vlandians, although I would love to see some more helmets and body armor. The UI section is huge with a ton of changes. Let's look closer at some of the notable ones. There are several more scene notifications that pop up on the right side of the screen for birth, marriage, death, and many more. They also added some cutscenes to go with them. The right side of the screen shows the new pop-ups for kingdom destruction and here we can see the cutscene for the northern empire along with some ominous music. They also changed some of the death options. Birth and death must now be enabled from the mod section screen before you even launch the game, and then it will show up as an option at the end of the character creation screen. They also added player character death, which is an option for those looking for a hardcore playthrough. The order of battle screen now has a separate save for field battles and sieges. This was really annoying to deal with, so I'm glad it's changed now. Moving on to the combat section. One of the biggest changes of the patch comes with blunt damage and armor in relation to blunt damage. The armor coefficient was reduced from 100 to 50, which essentially increases your effective HP while wearing body armor. Blunt damage's pure damage coefficient was reduced from 1 to 0.4, so armor has more effect at reducing incoming blunt damage. Additional armor effectiveness for blunt damage increased from 0 to 0.25, again increasing your effective HP while wearing armor. Finally, blunt weapon damage was decreased by 10% overall. Fortunately, I have the 1 vs 1 save against Durthurt, who is wearing late game armor. We we equip a top tier one-handed mace and go to town on old dirt bag. As you can see from each hit, the incoming damage is being reduced quite significantly. The first strike hits for 55 but was reduced by 34. The second hit does 40 and is reduced by 25 and the final blow hits the head for 50 damage but was reduced by a staggering 62 damage. Before the patch, it was normal for Durthurt to survive two hits at most, but now three hits is common, which is a nice change. Certain combat mechanic effects will now happen passively without any perks, such as knockback, knockdown, and dismount. The perks that enable these mechanics now increase or decrease the threshold for triggering. Weapons that can cause these effects are now labeled with a picture and tooltip like these two. In the testing, we saw a nearly 100% knockdown rate for each looter that took a hit that did not get killed. I'm really excited about this change as I think it will add a ton of possibilities, especially when combating cavalry. I'm really shocked to see the changes to crossbow given how much Tailworlds hates them. There are now three types of light crossbows which can be reloaded from horseback and while moving. Before, you could only move during the second half of the reload phase, making survival on foot with these crossbows 
Battles Blows dramatically harder. Moving on to the Battles and Sieges section. I can't express how happy I am to see this next change. Reinforcements will now be placed onto the map through an algorithm that picks the safest spot on the edge of the map. No more spawn camping, and more importantly, no more enemy troops spawning on top of your archers. In this custom 1000 vs 1000 unit battle, we can see reinforcements from the Sturgeon side coming from the edge of the map where they originally spawned in at. The Empire likewise spawns their reinforcements back near where they spawned in at. There were some big improvements to the AI during sieges, which I was thrilled to see. In the previous patch when they finally fixed the siege towers, they actually broke the defenders AI as they would often come way after the attackers were already on the wall. Now we can see the defenders move into place before the tower arrives and blocks the entrance. This should provide a good boost for siege defense. They also tweak the AI behavior and pathing so that defenders spend more time defending rather than repositioning. The defenders at the main gate will also be deployed in a more reasonable number and spread out to some of the other breaches. Again, there are a ton of changes here that could easily be on its own video, but trust me when I say the sieges are much more realistic now. I'm probably sounding like a broken record, but this next change is massive. We now have the ability to respec our perk selection for a modest payment of dinars. In order to access this feature, go to any arena and speak to the arena master in person. You will have two options to pick from, respecing your own perks or from one of your companions. At level 330, it only costs 13,000 dinars to redo all of one skill's perks. This opens up so many possibilities, building a character for the early game domination and switching to the late game perks for a small price later on. It's also critical for getting the right governor perks for companions. Simply make sure they have the right skill level and then pay to respect them if they have the wrong perk. Children will now level up with time rather than all at once in adulthood, which seems a bit more realistic. We won't go into too much detail for the next section for two reasons. First off, there are a ton of changes here. And second, I'm pretty salty that most of my guides are now no longer valid. I'm joking about the second part, sort of. But plenty of things that made no sense were fixed like scouting XP giving XP with larger parties moving at faster speeds, and killing higher tier enemies gives more combat XP. Leadership is also possible to level up without having a massive army to lead. Roguery XP is gained by leading bandits, and more XP is given for doing roguery things like raiding and pillaging. Many perks were fixed and rebalanced. Don't worry, I'll be putting together another video soon testing all of these. Moving on to the clan and party page, there are some really nice quality of life improvements that were long overdue. We can now swap out the leader of our clan parties. Going into the clan tab and party screen, then selecting one of our clan parties, there is a little symbol to the right of their name. Clicking on it brings up all available companions that can lead the party as well as their relevant skill stats. This is very useful and saves a ton of micromanagement time, particularly during peace times when you don't want to disband a party but you want the leader to be a governor and boost your fief efficiency. My favorite change, however, is the ability to recall companions into our party from a distance. In this test, we leave our companions in the tavern at Carbanseth and teleport away to try to recall them. Going to the clan screen and members tab, we can cycle through all of our companions to see who is available. Menacles is leading a party already so his button is grayed out, but Fukasis is available and will take 10 hours to reach our party. Waiting on the campaign map, we can see these companions eventually reach us and a pop-up at the top of the screen is displayed. Wanderer companion skills have been rebalanced and less scouts are now available. With the ability to respec our companions, this is actually actually very important change. Moving on to the army section, there are some low-key, huge changes. The AI has been adjusted to act smarter, although without a ton of hours testing it, it's hard to say if it's better or not. The point that pricked up my ears is this little ditty. Armies can now besiege settlements together. The player could always do this and it was great to join up with the siege that was already going on, but now the AI can do the same. I suspect many more fiefs will change hands now that they can team up. The creation chance of an army decreases with each active army in that kingdom up to a maximum of 5. This means that the AI is much more likely to form fewer armies that are bigger, resulting in epic field battles and sieges. Under the Kingdom and Diplomacy tab, Kingdom rulers will now send you requests to become their vassal or mercenary. For a mercenary contract, you can accept right on the spot. But for vassalage, you will still need to seek out the ruler and consummate the deal. Under the economy and trade section, there are some massive changes. Testing all of these would take several hours, so it's best to cover in a separate video, but we will take a quick look at some here. They adjusted the supply and demand for some items and made a trading campaign viable into the late game. Caravans and workshops are now more profitable, but also more risky. I ran a quick test with seven workshops and nine caravans just to get an idea of how they would perform. Workshops now sell for 17,000 up to 
25,000, so it's a big initial investment now. After a few months of production, some breweries were not earning any income at all, and caravan numbers were all over the place. I had workshops earning anywhere from zero to 500, and caravans earning anywhere from a negative number all the way up to 1,000 per day. Flasson19 does an amazing job testing both of these, so I look forward to seeing his findings for both. He also mentioned that the early game economy was drastically adjusted with prices of items being very expensive and eventually reaching a normal number after a few hundred days. Crafting saw another huge change. Weapon part unlocks are now tied directly to the type of weapons being crafted or smelted. Weapon part tiers also unlock lower tiers first before unlocking higher tier parts. This will dramatically slow down smithing progress because all of the tier 1 parts must be unlocked before a single tier 2 part will be unlocked, and so forth. This might be the balance to smithing that was badly needed. In testing, it took about 40 low tier two-handed swords being crafted and smelted down before I reached a single tier 2 part. Pommels were added to several weapon types, which will increase the XP gain from crafting these types of weapons and adjust their stats slightly. The best change of all, they added several two-handed maces, one of which you can craft from the very start. Just be aware, it does pierce damage due to the spikes, so it won't help you make prisoners. Also, there appears to be a bug with smithing where loading a save game will clear most of your unlocked parts, and I expect there to be a hotfix for this soon. Moving on to the settlement actions section. The upgrade chance of recruits has been lowered. This means that it'll be harder to find higher tier troops to recruit, making upgrading troops from battle will be more important than ever. In this test, after waiting a whole week, only a single infantry upgraded from tier 1 to tier 2, which is much slower than before. Notable in town are now fixed in number as opposed to being tied to the fief's prosperity. Prisoner limits at towns and castles are now in effect. In this test, we start with 10,000 prisoners, but the town has a limit of 30. They reduce by 1,000 for the first day, or 10%. This process will continue downward until the 30 out of 30 is reached. No more hoarding prisoners, sad times. Lots of quests were updated and tweaked, although further testing is needed to know if they were meaningful changes or not. Under the other section, they put a huge list of changes to troops and equipment. We won't have time to go over the list, but just be aware, lots of balance was done for 1.8.0. And finally, this little hidden gem. They added trait explanations to the encyclopedia, so now we no longer have to guess what a trait does. You can access the encyclopedia by pressing N, then clicking on concepts, then filtering by characters. Calculation, for example, represents the degree to which a character focuses on long-term goals or acts on their emotions. At the bottom, it states you can increase this trait by accomplishing goals without fighting, like through chat checks and completing missions. There are a few multiplayer changes, but to be honest, it looks quite sparse, which makes sense given the recent patch that focused exclusively on multiplayer. Below that, in the other section, is one of the most frustrating fixes. Trees will no longer block your formations while clicking and dragging. Before, it would be almost impossible to thin out a large formation of troops if trees were around, but now it's fixed. Yay. I don't know much about modding, but this section looks juicy as well, so hopefully it helps facilitate some amazing mods like its predecessor, Mountain Blade. As I mentioned at the start, this patch is thick, and covering every point would be impossible in a reasonable amount of time. With that being said, I am impressed with the many changes that I tested thus far. It's not going to feel like a brand new game as it relates to new content being added, but the balance changes and myriad quality of life changes are definitely worth trying out in my opinion. I can confidently say 1.8.0 is worth the upgrade. Don't forget to obliterate the like button. I appreciate your time and we'll see you soon. Before the patch, it was normal for Durfurt. Durfurt. Durfurt.